I want to check the uh, answers that you have for a couple of pages of questions. First of all, <clears throat> page 98. Check your own paper, or this will be for a grade. Page 98. Everybody ready? Number one. The period of peace in the Mediterranean world lasting from 31 BC to AD 180 was called what? Amelia. Um, the Pax Romana. Right. Pax Romana or Romana. Number two. Three titles or names by which Octavian was called. There are more than uh, three, but uh, you need to pick three out of the ones that we name here. Uh, Mia, give us the three you have. Princeps, Right. Anybody have another one? This one? Okay, those are the three listed in your book, I think. So uh, that's worth three points. Can you believe it? Number three. What did Octavian institute within the empire in order to provide for fairer taxing of provinces? What was that, Zach? It is a simple sentence. Um, Octavian instituted census taking in the Roman Empire in the fair tax and fair taxes. It took place every 14 years. All right. So census is the first part of that, and the second part he answered in his sentence as well, and that was how often, and that was 14 years. So two points: one for census and one for 14 years. Any question? Number four, uh, how did many of the self-seeking corrupt emperors of the late empire win the favor of the people? What do you say, Stephen? They provided free government. Right, exactly. Any question? All right, seven points on that page. Now, we move over to page 106. The first question, what culture greatly influenced Roman culture? John? Greek. Right, the Greek culture. Number two, who was called the Homer of Rome? Griff? Virgil. Right, Virgil. Number three, what city was this, was covered by the volcanic ash of Monte Vesuvius and not rediscovered until the mid-18th century? No? Pompeii. Right, Pompeii. One place my wife says she always wanted to go since she was a child. Pompeii. Yeah, any of you ever seen any pictures of Pompeii? It's pretty amazing. Uh, you, you see a whole figure of people. The person's not there anymore at all. There's all the volcanic ash that, that formed around them. Like I guess it is uh, very interesting. A lot of buildings that, uh, after they dug all the ash away, uh, still have uh, a lot of uh, the walls and paintings and so on. All right. Uh, that takes us then to number four, the name of the man and his theory that stated that the earth was the center of the universe. What do you say, Matthew? Ptolemy and his theory was the geocentric uh, century. Right. Uh, correct. Uh, Ptolemy and it's called a geocentric theory. Geocentric meaning earth centered. Two points, one for Ptolemy, one for geocentric. All right, and the last question. Uh, the leading Stoic philosopher of the Roman Empire who also served as a tutor to an emperor. Who was that, Amelia? Um, Seneca. And the famous pupil was? And Nero. Nero. Seneca and Nero. Two points. So seven points on that page as well. Fourteen points total. I put the number incorrect up at the top. Circle it so that I can find it easily. And I will collect it and record that for you. How many, how many of you got them all right? Okay, quite a few. That's good. Today we're going to begin watching a, a video uh, made by the same person who did the video on building the pyramid. Remember that? You guys like that? I think it's got that same uh, interaction uh, and the, the different venues, a cartoon plus live action, all those things. Only this is about building a Roman city, uh, not in Rome, but of Romans building a city out somewhere else. So you get a lot of ideas as to um, Roman culture, uh, the interaction between the Romans and other people, and things like that. So I think you'll enjoy it. And it takes place during the time 
of Caesar Augustus. So I thought this would be a good place for us to watch it even before we begin looking at the subsequent emperors. So let's watch together. Roman cities. Dominating the entire space was the Temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. I always forget that when you put a, a VHS tape in a VCR, it starts. Whether you tell it to or not. So it already started. And there's only one speed on fast. Like DVDs where you can go double, triple, quadruple speed. So you get to see a little bit of the backwards before we see it forwards. Which is plenty of fun for the people at home as well. If you're at home, you probably can't fast forward with this part. I was about to get it set up before you came in, and something distracted me. That was the problem. Ah, here we go. The presentation is the PBS Home Video. This is a plaster cast of a man writhing in agony as he suffocates, buried alive in burning volcanic ash. Thousands of people died this way in the Roman city of Pompeii one August day in 79 AD. This entire city was smothered beneath a 12 foot blanket of ash that fell from Mount Vesuvius, still haunting and threatening above the Bay of Naples. Nearby, Herculaneum suffered a different but no less horrible fate. It was buried beneath a sea of volcanic mud. But this tragedy managed to leave its own memorial. Pompeii and Herculaneum stayed buried for more than 1,600 years. And when excavations began, they revealed a picture of everyday life in one of the world's most influential civilizations. The remains of Roman cities can be found across three continents, visible proof of the impact of this ancient culture of city builders. In fact, much of what makes up our modern cities, the grand public buildings, theaters and stadiums, the way streets and blocks are laid out, even municipal water supplies, all have their roots in ancient Roman cities. To the Romans, the city was more than a collection of bricks, blocks, and buildings. It was the center of their culture. Legend has it that Rome was founded near where I'm standing by Romulus and Remus, two young princes cast out to die by their jealous uncle, but saved and nurtured by a wolf to fulfill their destiny. The guiding spirit of Romulus was never far from the hearts and minds of those who built Rome's cities, which eventually stretched from one end of the Western world to the other. By the time of Jesus, 
the Romans controlled much of Europe and the Mediterranean. Rome built its empire through alliances, treaties, and military conquests. And until the empire began to collapse around 400 AD, its provinces and territories contributed heavily to the wealth and status of the city of Rome. This is a model of Rome at the height of the empire, about 300 AD. It gives us a good idea of the size and complexity of this fabled city. And like most modern cities, ancient Rome was noisy, congested, and expensive. It boasted a population of over a million, far larger than any other city in the world. It was the place to live, a symbol that all Romans held culturally and spiritually dear. And wherever they settled, they tried to recreate the best aspects of Mother Rome. Structures like these were built from Spain to the Dead Sea, from Britain to North Africa, and they were built to last, first in cut blocks of quarried stone, later in brick-faced concrete. The Romans came not just to conquer, but to stay, and the cities they built would alter the character of the land and the world of its people forever. To the Romans, the well-planned city, like me here in southern France, began with its layout or grid, which time and sprawl have erased. But this is what it would once have looked like. Virtually all Roman cities were laid out in this regular pattern of streets and blocks with the major public buildings located in the center, or forum. Now, each city needed certain things, houses, markets, and shops, aqueducts, or some system for bringing in fresh water, baths and playing fields for the bottom, temples for the soul, theaters and amphitheaters for entertainment. And the city also needed walls. Walls, like these at Pompeii, set the geographic limits of the city and offered defense against enemies. And just inside the walls, a sacred trench called the Pomerium defined the spiritual boundary of the city and assured the protection of the gods for all its inhabitants. To the Romans, the wall and the Pomerium were the dividing line between order and disorder, between culture and chaos. The gates in the walls lead to the main streets which in turn open onto the Forum. The Forum was the focal point of commerce and local politics. As you can see, it's still pretty much the center of things. Along this side of the Forum of Pompeii was a large market called the Machellum. Next to it, another market just for the sale of cloth. Across the way, the large basilica which housed the courts of law. There was a speaker's platform and the other main government buildings. Dominating the entire space was the Temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, which symbolically and spiritually linked this city with Rome itself. If I were standing here 2,000 years ago, I would have been surrounded by a two-story colonnade that provided shade for the throngs who came here daily. The Forum was the heart of the city, physically connecting it to the surrounding farmland and in turn linking the entire region with Rome. The spread of Roman cities affected all the regions they touched, whether the local inhabitants liked it or not. This was particularly true in France, an area the Romans called Gaul. The Celtic people of Gaul were forcibly subdued in a campaign led by the most famous Roman of them all, Julius Caesar. He was eventually succeeded by his nephew, Augustus, who tied Gaul more closely to Rome, especially through new cities built on the sites of Caesar's victories. Our story begins in the year 27 BC. A generation has settled the dust of conflict, but not the bitter memories. And the town we're calling Verbonia is beginning its new life as a city of empire.
Jesus and get out. We need him in chains back to Rome. And at Oxford of Dunham, our last stronghold, he cut off the right hands of our choirs. Here they come, Marcus of Nicias. Caesar Augustus's legions, now beginning new lives as merchants and farmers in the midst of this Celtic wilderness. But with the help of the gods, Lothonia will soon rival any city in Gaul and reflect the glory of Rome herself. As long as the Celts keep the peace and do not plague us with their mischief. And if they do, they shall feel the might of Rome yet again. Ah, Tullia, you are here. Come, let us greet our citizens, as befits the new leader of this community and his gracious wife. Gaius Valerius was one of Augustus Caesar's greatest generals. And when the emperor honored him with leading the founding of his new colony in Gaul, the general so honored me, a humble military engineer, with the task of overseeing its construction. And I hope I can prove a worthy architect. <laughs> Be strong, Marcus Apicius. It is our first line of defense if we are ever threatened. Though he's laid down his sword. Gaius Valerius still thinks for the common sense of a general. Oh, careful, you fools! Careful! Careful! The esteemed Lysinus is himself of this land. He had been Julius Caesar's slave, then Caesar freed him. Now, he's procurator of all Gaul, representative of Caesar Augustus himself, and a figure of universal respect. It's a born slug. I hope you have a better set of plans this time for me to bother coming out in this heat. I trust you will find these satisfactory. Marcus? My slave, Lorenz, was a gift from Gaius Valerius, demonstrating, I'm sure, his great esteem for me. As in every Roman town, Bavonia will have an orderly arrangement of streets and blocks <coughs> that will lay out nicely along the river. Here we have the Forum, the Market, the Bathhouse, and the Basilica. And here's the one that's <coughs> the asked for, Procurator. A theatre for the entertainment of the populace. Uh, and you make certain my statue is prominently displayed above the stage. Oh, yes, certainly. The sculptures are carving it now. Personally, I'm looking forward to the time when we can build an amphitheatre for our gladiators and have some real drama. Well, and good. But the city's first priority must be houses. I trust you are making your assignments for the proper people in line. We have saved you a prime plot within the city, as well as a large estate in the hills beyond. I should hope so. I also trust you are now enlisting the aid and goodwill of my native people in your efforts to build the city. Uh, yes, yes, my engineer Marcus Abricius is paying a call on the Celtic leader Acker Bouvier tomorrow. <laughs> Akabubiex had a formidable reputation. Wonderful neighbors, these Gauls. Not everyone would think to put skulls in a doorway. They're from my father's time. We haven't done much of that lately. Now, what is it you wish of me and my people? Akko graciously extended the courtesy of his house. Before long, we were able to strike a bargain. He would provide a sufficient number of skilled craftsmen, and they in turn would receive a year's free use of the Bavonia docks. Now, your fine ironwork will be seen all the way to Egypt, and merchants will come from far and wide, offering you trade. Akko also introduced me to his lovely daughter, Aidan, of whom he is most proud. She has a proper and gratifying respect for her father, and if she were only a Roman citizen, she might make a fine wife. I, I think 
think you like having the Romans here. I do not like having the Romans here. When I was your age, I fought the Romans. But that was the past. We have to look to the future. And like it or not, the future is with Rome. Not everyone agrees with you. You're not speaking of the Druids, are you? And if I am? You had better not be mixed up with the Druids. Did you hear me, Aidan Bouvier? <laughs> The Romans span the sacred river. Now they are destroying our way of life. All of our gods are angry. We must never forget what has been done to us. With Akin's help, construction of the town has progressed rapidly. Let us hope so, for everyone's sake. This is the Pont du Gard, a 2,000 year old aqueduct near Nîmes in France, which has become one of this country's most popular attractions. priority for any city is a constant supply of fresh water. And the covered trough at the top of the Pont du Gard was once part of a 30 mile long aqueduct that brought water to need from high up in the mountains. The key to aqueduct design is gravity. Once the engineers located the source of water in the mountains, they built their aqueduct with a gentle downward slope to ensure that the water would flow along its entire length. The aqueduct rested on a series of arches, which were supported above the varying terrain of massive stone piers. But when the aqueduct had to cross a river or a ravine, and it became either impossible or impractical to build those stone piers, the engineers instead built larger arches. And if necessary, they built several larger arches, such as we see here at the Pont du Gard. An arch is composed of separate wedge-shaped blocks that are cut and fitted together in a curve. The blocks are held in place by a wooden frame until they are locked together at the top with a keystone. The weight of the arch at the top presses down and pushes the sides outward. But when you support these sides, the outward forces are counteracted. Now the wooden centering can be removed because the entire structure was stable. And with this design, the Romans could span almost any terrain. The Romans didn't invent the arch, but once they understood its potential, they used it again and again to span both interior and exterior space, and to carry water literally hundreds of miles, if that's what was needed. When water from an aqueduct reached the city, it first went to a large holding tank or reservoir, like this one at Pompeii. Now the water entered the tank from this side. It flowed across the floor through these three channels and out through these three passages. This one led to the homes of the rich, that one to the baths and public laboratories, and this one to the public fountains. Now, if there was a shortage of water, the passage to the homes of the rich would be shut off first, then the passage to the baths and public laboratories. This ensured that the public fountains, which served the majority of the city's residents, would be the last to run dry. That, at least, was the theory. Here's one of the many public fountains that lined the streets of Pompeii, and where most of the city's residents got their water. Of course, none of them work now. But providing water for drinking and cooking was one of the municipal services expected of a proper Roman town. 
There was even a sophisticated drainage system that channeled wastewater to rivers of the sea. This level of sanitation wasn't equaled again for almost 2,000 years. Another Roman priority was the bathhouse, which was far more than just a place to get clean. Bathhouses or thermae began with subterranean passages containing furnaces and pipes to carry the water to the rooms above. Slaves would have stoked these fires continuously to heat the water for the hot room or calgarium. Bathers would luxuriate in hot water pools like this one, cleansing their bodies and presumably their minds as well. The hot water and steam were carried through clay pipes in the floors and walls that warmed this room and the next, the tepidarium, where the water and room temperature were kept comfortably warm. And if you wanted a refreshing cold water plunge, you would go to this room, the frigidarium. In the baths, you'd meet with friends, discuss business or politics, work out, get a rub down, or just escape from the cares of the day. We've been in the main bathhouse at Ostia. Both men and women would use these elaborate facilities, although not at the same time. And of course, we've only been talking about affluent citizens. The working classes would rarely have had an opportunity to enjoy the baths, or much else for that matter. They'd have been far too busy just keeping them functioning, along with everything else that made these cities work so well. There's been so much progress in Babonia. I can hardly believe only a year has passed. We're experimenting with reservoirs fashioned out of concrete. And what exactly is concrete, Marcus Fabricius? A mixture of stone and cement, which can be molded to any desired shape. Hmm. Extraordinary. It was demonstrated to me by an engineer from Rome. A wooden support is erected, and brick reinforcing arches are constructed over it. The entire structure is lined with flat bricks and wooden forms, and then covered with this concrete. When the concrete hardens, we will repeat the process over and over until the entire reservoir is complete. It can be molded to any shape, yet will retain the strength and solidity of stone at a fraction of the weight and cost. What have the Romans come up with next? Many people live in completed houses. And for the first time in my life, I have a house of my own with all its comforts. And this garden in the back, it's in much sunshine and takes advantage of the cooling breezes. One could get lambago from these drafts. Lawrence, you are always complaining. Hooray the household gods, he always provides me with ample to complain of. <coughs> Someday, when I can afford it, I shall have a proper slave. With my new elevated status in life, I can partake in luxuries I could only dream of up till now. And Gaius Valerius has invited prominent Gauls to use the new bathhouse, donated by their exalted countryman Lysimus. It certainly was generous of Lysimus to build this bathhouse. Lysimus is always generous with other people's money. What do you mean? He has taxed all the Gauls to ruin. But since this does not affect you Romans, perhaps you do not care. But Lysidus must have a plan. Yes, to become rich. Make no mistake, I have seen his kind before. He would sell out his own people if it would. Acco Bubeix, my humble master, Lysinus, requests the honour of your presence in Marseille, two days hence, at the third hour after dawn, together with General Gaius Valerius. See? There you are. When the fox invites the rabbit to dine, the rabbit should first know the menu. And therefore, I shall require two months' additional taxes from everyone. Have we not already paid through the year? Ah, hmm. well, that's an interesting point. As the month for December means the 10th, we will add two more following it to fill out the year. Of course, in the spirit of harmony, Roman citizens will contribute as well. That is preposterous. It is not preposterous if I say it is not. Surely you cannot mean. Surely I can mean as I wish. Do not forget yourself, gentlemen. I am Lysus, the procurator of Gaul, the representative of Imperator Caesar Augustus himself. I tell you, this new tax will not sit well with my people. Nor with mine, but they will only grumble. 
You must deal with your countrymen to keep the peace. Though I am a chieftain, I do not command the loyalty of all. Such wanton destruction! And such a great act of generosity! What could it mean to break off the right hand? Who would do such a thing? Perhaps they who have had it done to them. Now we all have peace and opportunity on the road. Not all the Celts feel that way. Aidan. The Druids certainly do not. The Druids, they hide in the woods and pray to trees. They're all living in the past. Um, look, I'll, uh, I'll see you tonight. Hmm? Second hour after sunset? Yes. And if perhaps your daughter is not otherwise engaged? My daughter will be pleased to accept your generous invitation. What? Set one more place for dinner. Oh, of course. Why not? Let's have 20 more. No, 30. What's Caesar's army doing? I'm sure there's a garrison that hadn't eaten. Hmm? One moment, I'll see to the delay. Believe me, Master, I want this to work even more than you do. What are you talking about? To impress the young lady into marrying you, heaven help her. Who said anything about marriage? I've seen the way you regard her. I could not marry her. She's not a Roman. You best marry someone, or I shall die of exhaustion. And then you'll have to do your own work. You're not overly burdened. I'm a slave. You treat me like a wife. This large house in Pompeii has a two-story central hall with a roof that is open to the sky so that rainwater can fall into this pool called the impluvium. The water then goes through this hole into an underground tank where it is stored until needed. We're in the home of Pacrius Proculus, a local government representative and the owner of several small businesses. Most Roman houses of this size face inward, away from the street noise. The sleeping rooms and dining rooms were in this, the atrium area of the house. But the most impressive part is out here. Much of Roman life was lived out of doors. The gardens of Pompeii are among the most famous in the world, and every wealthy home had one, surrounded by a covered walkway called a peristyle. On warm days, the master and his family would sit underneath the broad overhanging roof while the garden soaked up the rain and flourished in the sun. If you were well-to-do and lived in a prosperous city like Pompeii, that was about as good as life could be in the ancient world. In fact, you could even use your house as an extra source of income. Ground floor rooms that faced the street were often used as shops and rented out by the owner. In several of the houses, we see wine and olive presses, indicating lucrative cottage industries run right from these elegant homes. What made the wealthy domestic lifestyle work so well, however, was slave labor. Houses like this would have had many slaves to do the cleaning, serving, and other chores. For the most part, the lot of the Roman slave was as deplorable as the lot of all slaves throughout history. Although in cities like Pompeii, some slaves became skilled craftsmen. Others even owned certain industries. A few slaves were accomplished artists and produced beautiful sculpture and paintings. This impressive residence was once owned by the Vettius brothers, 
when we think had once been slaves. But this kind of upward social mobility was definitely the exception rather than the rule. Not all cities were as dependent on slaves as Pompeii and Herculaneum. Ostia was a working class town, a major commercial city, and the principal seaport to Rome. <coughs> Though it's silted up now, the river was once lined with ships laden with cargo. At its height, Ostia boasted many warehouses, like this one. It also had scores of shipping companies and a population that reached 100,000 people. Instead of the lavish townhouses we saw in Pompeii, most people lived in apartment buildings called insulae, which actually translates as islands. Tenants who lived on the upper floors got to their apartments by climbing these stairs. Insulae were made of brick-faced concrete and could hold a dozen or more families. No need for a health club if you lived here. We clearly left the extravagant lifestyle behind, but these practical, well-built, and essentially fire-resistant buildings would have been affordable, and by the standards of the day, decent places to live. This bar on the ground floor of an apartment block had an excellent view of the street and offered a wide variety of wines for sale. Mm, thank you. And remembering our practical Roman planners, there were public toilets located conveniently throughout the city with separate facilities for both men and women. And on that matter, at least, there must have been some equality between the sexes because archaeologists haven't been able to tell which room is which. I hope I'm in the right one. Let me through. One side, please. So much for your vaulted water system. What are you talking about? There isn't any. Water from the mountains running to every house. Oh, that idea wouldn't work for long. You say my sinners cut off the water to all private houses. But why? With the lack of rain, unless there are conservation measures, soon there will be a shortage. So those who require it may now purchase their water from the central reservoir. My servant will collect the money. Well, can you sense that there's going to be some conflict here? Yes. Because the guy who's in charge is not a very good ruler. He seems to be only in it for himself. Well, we'll see some interesting things to come yet, and some things to learn about Roman culture. So Monday we will continue with Roman City.